So good afternoon, everybody who's already tuned in. This is the Healthy Aging Conversation that happens at four o'clock every Tuesday afternoon. I'm Jeremy Hughes, and I'm the host of this conversation with a special guest every week. And it's put on by Care Visions Healthy Aging, whose Facebook site you've come to to watch this uh, conversation this afternoon. Care Visions is a care provider for people with dementia and is interested in the well-being of older people generally and healthy aging, hence the title of these conversations, Healthy Aging Conversations. And since coronavirus, they've started putting a whole load of material up on websites uh, and up on their YouTube channel uh, and their Facebook site in order to give people um, a chance to get the benefits of uh, being part of a community when they might be in lockdown or shielding or less connected than otherwise. And this week is no exception. They've put a couple of new videos up, which you might want to look at that are available from the Care Visions site. Uh, one, and both of which are about the widest way of which people can live well and feel part of society and community. So one is called The Living Library, and it's the story of the Travellers Club, which is one of the Pall Mall clubs set up in the 19th century. Um, lovely touch is that it was, they adopted as their logo or their, their device, as they called it at the time, um, a statue of Odysseus or, or, or Ulysses, who of course, from Homer's book, uh, is one of the world's greatest travellers. And it's been a home over the last century or more now for travellers around the world to come together. So that's an introduction to the library at the Travellers Club, which is available on the Facebook site and YouTube site of Care Visions, and is a precursor to them setting up a virtual reading club to encourage people to connect together and read a book together. So that'll be coming in the coming weeks. And then the second one completely differently is their presenter, Steph McConville, who many people will have seen already, doing a program called The Seven Wonders of the Modern World, where she takes the seven wonders of the world as set up from ancient times, of which I think probably the pyramids are the only ones still around today. And so many of the others have disappeared. But in 2007, there was a major program to identify the seven new wonders of the modern world. And those are now uh, covered in this program called Seven Wonders of a Modern World, A Journey of a Lifetime. And one thing I found particularly interesting when I was watching that was that the, of those seven wonders of the modern world, three of them are all in the same continent. Now, I won't tell you which continent it is, uh, but it surprised me that three of them all came from that one continent. So do have a look at that program. Um, as always, Care Visions has on its site not just the new material it's producing, but a range of material for people to use, which includes programs developed by their dementia therapists. So the team that developed their dementia therapy services in, in Camden in London, building on the experiences they have with the care vision services in China, have taken dementia therapy sessions and put them online, where you get a mix of reminiscence, music, physical activity, a full program of dementia support available online. So do also look at those as well as the healthy aging material uh, that I've just mentioned. And that's all available on their YouTube site and Facebook site. So I think we're just about on four o'clock this afternoon and I'm delighted to introduce my guest this afternoon, which is Professor Subi Banerjee, who is the Executive Dean of the Faculty of Health at Plymouth University. Uh, Subi has had a fantastic career, really been a pioneer and a champion for healthy living and for supporting people with dementia over the last decade in particular, when he was the architect, which I'll come back to in a few minutes, of the UK or the England dementia strategy uh, produced in 2009. And uh, since then, he was at King's College of London, uh, at Brighton Medical School, and now at Plymouth University. So a great career. Subi, welcome this afternoon. I'm going to start with something to make us all feel a bit better, because it's, it's good to have a bit of feel good around at this time. When well, we all, need a, little, we all um, need a little bit of that, don't we, Jeremy? Absolutely. So I'm going to ask you for your happiest moment in the past week. What stood out for you in the past week and brought a smile to your face? Uh, well, I mean, the, the last week's been quite complicated in that if you're kind of trying to help run a university, um, particularly one with a really large faculty of health like we've got, we've got 42 percent of the university is the six health schools that uh, that I look after. And we've had a little bit of an issue with exam grades, as you probably uh, <laughs> worked out over the last uh, well, over the last couple of weeks but particularly in the last week and we've been trying to um, put together uh, pick up the pieces really of the uh, the complications and difficulties that so many students across the country have had 
Um, and what it's meant, of course, is that many more individuals uh, are out there, are trying to get into courses which have traditionally been quite controlled in terms of numbers. So things like uh, child health and midwifery, things like medicine and dentistry. Um, so we've been working really hard to try and make those things work for people so that they are able to come into um, medicine dentistry and those other things this year. So I suppose the, the single thing that, um, that uh, made me most happy this week is that we were able to find, uh, we were able to find a way to be able to accept an extra 50 medical students and an extra 20 dental students and an extra 20 midwives into our courses, which means that those are people who, you know, who, who got the grades, who will now be able to come in and train with us this year, rather than being asked to defer to next year or go somewhere else. So that felt like a really good thing. It was really nice to be able to let um, our admissions tutors, who'd been having some really difficult conversations with students over the past year, past sorry, past week, and and it'd been really distressing for them. It was really great to be able to give them some good news to give to people for a change. Yeah, no, that's a lovely way to. Bring to, bring to a conclusion, at least for the time being, what well, must have been a very traumatic week. And I think your happy moment is probably a happy moment for 90 other people as well, which are the 90 people who've got places who were feeling uncertain about their future, whether in nursing and midwifery, in doctors or dentistry. That, that's a really great story and a great up, upbeat start to our conversation. Yeah, so we'll, let, let's move back to the development of the dementia strategy for England. And if anyone watching wants to ask a question, then please do use the comments space uh, on the Facebook site where you can put your question in and we'll come to a, as many questions as we can towards the end of this half hour. But Shubi, you were really a prime architect of making sure that England was one of the first countries in the world to have a dementia strategy uh, in 2009. What, what led you to pushing that so hard and how, how much has been achieved as a result? So, uh, I uh, it's kind of you to say that. Um, and certainly uh, we, we in England were one of the first countries to come up with a national dementia strategy and, uh, and the first to come up with as comprehensive a strategy as we were able to come up with as well. Well, I, I mean, I've been working very hard alongside a whole lot of people, including the Alzheimer's Society, over five or six years beforehand, making the case of the fact that dementia was a subject and was a, it was a group of of people who had you know, really profound needs where there was an, a, a really strong increase in the numbers of those individuals and where services were serially failing those individuals and that actually you know, doing it better was within our grasp also. We were making that case for dementia becoming a priority. And in the couple of years leading up to 2008-9 when we launched the strategy, um, I was, work, I was seconded into the Department of Health and my one desire was to get dementia as a national priority and to, for there to be a national dementia strategy created, which was you know, equivalent to the fantastic strategies that have been launched, launched for things like cancer and stroke. Mm. So that was my one desire. And during that time, we managed to make that case. And there was a lot of hard work because at that time, people said, oh, we don't need other priorities. It's up to individual you know, local authorities and local um, uh, commissioners to make their own decisions. We hear a lot of that now now as well. Um, but we managed to make that case. We managed to put it together and we managed to carry out the largest consultation that the Department of Health had ever carried out. So we and that was one which absolutely and integrally involved people with dementia and family carers right from the very beginning. And, and that's been a sort of talisman mark all the way through, hasn't it, of, of actually a way of making sure that the the, the way in which the, the strategy is developed is, is crafted by and informed by people with that lived experience themselves. And, and without that, strategies are simply shiny pieces of paper that fail. Now, one of the things that I have believed in and is absolutely vital is real, meaningful co-production of both policy and strategy, but also of research in the whole of uh, in the whole of my career in dementia research and uh, uh, going through into education now. We're doing work now with, um, with education whereby people with dementia are the people delivering the education for 
um, uh, for medical students and nursing students in our time for dementia program that you know about. But you're absolutely right. One of the strengths, one of the reasons why the National Dementia Strategy has really had the effect that I think it has had is its provenance is strong because it was profoundly inclusive of the voice of people with dementia and the voice of carers right from the very beginning. Yeah, and, and I think that's, as I say, an enormous strength. Now, you just mentioned the Time for Dementia programme, which I know about, but of course, most of the viewers don't. Um, but that has been an example of one of the changes that's happened within the context of the strategy, where you might want to say a little bit more about how you've changed the whole nature of, of medical training to, to reflect that, that lived experience knowledge that people previously haven't had. I'm not sure about changing the whole of medical training. Uh, <laughs> I mean, that's uh, that's uh, that's a, a little bit more. But actually, what are um, what our, our, our what our our goal was in setting up um, time for dementia was absolutely as ambitious as that. It was to enable students to understand, to be able to walk in the shoes, to be able to look at the health system from the viewpoint of people with dementia and their family carers fundamentally believed when I was discussing this when we were thinking of setting this up some seven eight years ago now uh, in Kent Surrey and Sussex absolutely believed that one of the ways that we um, one of the ways that we were able to uh, uh, change the way that the future workforce works would absolutely be by changing their attitudes and understanding and we, we wondered how you could do that and so the, the kind of the magic fairy pixie dust that we came up with was something that's really difficult to achieve in healthcare training. We decided that we would introduce pairs of students to a family with dementia, a person with dementia and a family caring, carer in the first year of their, of their training and that they would then visit that family every three months for two years and we do reflective work. And essentially what we did was put the family, the person with dementia and the carer, absolutely in the uh, driving seat. They were the teachers. They are the teachers right. for our students. They aren't uh, the subjects of, of, of examinations. They are the people who teach our students what it is to, to, what it is to, um, to live with dementia. And our students uh, learn so much more than stuff about dementia. Mm. They learn about what it's like to be old and ill in society. They learn, um, they learn about compassion and understanding. They learn to communicate with people. They lead to, and the power comes from seeing the health system from their viewpoint, the, yes. the viewpoint of families rather than the viewpoint of, of health services. And you start seeing the, um, you know, the, the ways that health systems fail people with dementia, because over two years, all sorts of things happen. These people have all sorts of problems and you see how the health system fails, but they start then developing ways that the health system can win. And it's often simple things like listening to people, mm -hmm. taking time and actually changing these expectations of um, the ex very low expectations that people sometimes have. So, so that one, of my, one of my colleagues has, has, has recently written uh, about Time for Dementia that it develops moral courage in mm -hmm. students the ability to challenge the status quo and to improve things. And that's people with dementia developing the, model, the, the, the moral courage of medical, dental and allied health professional students. And Sorry, I'm very excited by- No, no, it's, it's because I think it is a revolutionary change because if you embed that in the training, uh, where previously, if you at best, a lot of people in their medical training would get a couple of hours about dementia and it would just be classroom learning from a textbook. And, a, and a, an academic presenter. This is actually real life training, which stays with people all their lives. Let me move on now to the current day, because I want to spend most of our time talking about the new Lancet Commission report that you were a co-author on that came out just last month. Um, and this is a report that looks at prevention of dementia. Now, when you developed the dementia strategy in 2008 and nine, prevention really wasn't on the agenda very much. And I remember back in 2010, talking to people in the United States and they said, oh, you can't do anything to prevent dementia. Don't even try thinking about it. There, we've now had two Lancet Commission reports, the first one a couple of years ago, and then the updated one uh, just this month or the, the, the end of, came out at the end of July. Um, what, what's changed? Why, why do we now think we can talk about prevention in the way that we couldn't 10 years ago? Well, I think we were starting to talk about prevention. We'd always known that there must be some things that you can do 
that that would be good for your brain health. I think what's really exciting about the last 15 years is that it has become much clearer what those things actually are. When we put the National Dementia Strategy together, we talked about what's good for your heart is good for your head, because we knew that there were cardiovascular risk factors for vascular dementia. We knew that there were cardiovascular risk factors for Alzheimer's disease as well. So we knew that there was something there in terms of prevention. What things like the Lancet Commission have enabled us to do is to really delineate two things. The first is the proportion of dementia that is potentially modifiable and therefore potentially preventable. And secondly, what the elements of that are, both in terms of early life and in midlife and in later life, it starts to point us towards what it is that we that might be able to be done that might lead to a decrease in the numbers of those with dementia in the population. And some of the things are things, as you say, that go right back to education. So that I was interested in the first Lancet Commission report, it talked about primary and secondary education, just the level of educational attainment, the way in which people, young people's brains are developed as children, has an impact on their susceptibility or the progression of dementia later in life. Absolutely. The, 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 the thing that we want to do if you want to, if you want to prevent dementia at a population level uh, is to increase the amount of cognitive reserve that people have. So that's the amount of the, the, how, 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 um, how connected your brain is. And obviously during early life, the, 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 the thing that enables us to grow our brains and to grow the complexity of the connections in our brain is education. It's interaction and social interaction, interaction but it's also education. So it's brilliant when something that is such an important thing for the world as a whole, which is the introduction of, of universal education, of good quality education for, uh, for young people, one of the kind of millennial goals of the, of, the, of the United Nations, that in itself contributes about 7% of the risk of, uh, uh, of dementia later in life. So the more you do early, the more you're saving up and building your brain for the future. Yeah, but it's not, it's not only early life. So there are things you can do throughout your life that make a difference. And in the, the latest report that's just been published, um, alcohol consumption comes up as one of the new factors where there now seems fairly clear evidence that excessive alcohol consumption does have a detrimental effect and can uh, damage your, 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 your brain and, and, and affect your risk of dementia. Is that right? Yes, it is right. And I think the point that you make about the fact that there are things that we can do throughout our life course in order to promote brain health is absolutely right. So for alcohol, that was one of the newer things that have come in. And we are talking about heavy alcohol use here. We're talking about an intake of over 21 units per week. So that's drinking at a relatively high level. There is still this U-shaped curve and this kind of Mediterranean thing about, about heart health that, that, that applies. But yes, if you're, if you're drinking heavily, that kills brain cells. And that is a problem in midlife as well as in later life for the uh, for the development of dementias. And quick off the mark, actually, I've just seen that one question that's already come in, which I think you've answered, is from someone called John, who said, I'd heard that red wine was a good to drink to prevent dementia, and now you're saying to avoid alcohol, which is it? So I'm not saying avoid alcohol, <laughs> and I'm not, I'm saying that, uh, that and certainly a, a, there, there is evidence that a relatively modest intake of alcohol, uh, particularly red wine, may be of help. Um, but it's not, but the, the issue is that red wine is, it's not that red wine is good for you. If you drink two bottles of red wine, that's bad for you. If you drink a bottle of red wine a day, that's bad for you. If you drink a glass of red wine per day, that is either neutral or good for you. So okay. it, that's it's clear that one up. the amount. That's helpful. The other one, the, the, there were three new risk factors in the report this year. So one was excess, excessive, and as you say, it is excessive alcohol consumption. The other two were head injury and air pollution. Can I just ask you about air pollution? Because I remember there was a study in Canada a few years ago that looked at an increased incidence of dementia of people living on a, a main road with lots of traffic and pollution. Uh, and at that time, people weren't sure because they could have, there, there was some suggestion that the increased dementia risk was actually because it was people with a lower health quality, a lower quality health of life who lived in cheap housing on main roads and the pollution may not have been the factor. Um, but now you're saying that there is fairly clear evidence that air pollution is a factor. So the, 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 one of the 
the strengths of the Lancet Commission's approach and Jill Livingston, who leads the programme, has been absolutely, um, absolutely clear that this needs to be central to everything is that the the work that it does is to take the evidence that exists and to carry out the most rigorous possible uh, synthesis of that information. So bringing together data from multiple sources. So that's the first stage. But secondly, then to actually run each of these risks alongside each other. So you get a, an idea of what the individual risks mean rather than the things as a whole. So for air pollution, you're absolutely right. The Lancet Commission did suggest that uh, there are things, there is an emerging evidence base that has really come out in the last four or five years since the first Lancet Commission, but an emerging uh, evidence base that, that, that atmospheric pollution, that air pollution of particular types may well be detrimental to your brain health um, in the same way as alcohol is likely to be detrimental to your brain health. Yeah. Um, and traumatic brain injury is likely to be detrimatic, de detrimental to your brain health. And, so, and clearly there are other things that poor air pollution will do and poor air quality. It will affect your respiratory health. It will affect, affect your cardiovascular health. And it may be through these respiratory and cardiovascular problems that your brain is affected. That may well be the process. But again, it's very important for us to start identifying those things that are potentially modifiable because if we have great heart health and if we improve, if we decrease smoking and treat diabetes, which are two really strong and powerful factors, if we do that, then there are benefits to, to, to individuals in terms of cancer, but there are benefits in terms of heart disease. There are benefits in terms of the prevention of dementia. And that's a really important message. It gives you even more reason for doing the right thing. So um, that, that's really helpful in terms of giving, and we'll come back to the advice for individuals in a minute. But so let me just deal with the third new factor that came up, which was about head injury. Now, there's quite a lot of publicity in the last year or so around repeated head injury of footballers who had headed the ball and some study, I think, done in Scotland uh, with the Football Association, looking at the fact that that did have a detrimental effect. But again, yeah. is, it, is it about excessive? So should people be worried if their children are, pl are playing football and, and head the ball now and again? Is that is that what you're talking about? Or is it, what, 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 what level of head injury are we talking about? So the, what we're talking about with traumatic brain injury is, um, is generally repeated traumas, as you've talked about in terms of sport, or individual single traumas uh, that may be to do with um, you know, road traffic accidents and other things. Mm -hmm. What's become clear is that that is an important factor. So that um, you've talked about the, 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 uh, the issue with football in the United Kingdom. The issue is much more strong for American football, of course, in the US, when the National Football League has done a lot of excellent work looking at the effects of multiple traumatic brain injuries on individuals who've worked in, uh, in, 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 in uh, professional football and in mm -hmm. college football. Um, the difference between professional footballers and amateur footballers is the amount of football they play and the amount of practice that they have. So that the actual exposure is very much higher in those individuals who are professionals compared to those who aren't. Uh, certainly one wants to be um, careful with one's head and I think that the increasing focus on the appropriate management of head injuries and those protocols for those head injuries that exist throughout rugby, for example, now, as well as as well as in football, are, uh, are taking sensible approaches and measured approaches to be able to deal with the risks and to manage right. those risks. So that, and that's a good message about prevention overall is about managing risk uh, rather than just feeling despairing and, and that there's nothing you can do about it. Going back to the, the original study in 2017, um, some, of the, some of the findings I wasn't surprised at, so obesity, lack of exercise, um, uh, depression, smoking were, were all factors that increased your risk of dementia. One that I was surprised at at the time, and it'd be interesting to hear more about, was, was lo loss of hearing, particularly midlife loss of hearing, yeah. seemed, to, seemed to have a, 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 a significant effect. Why is that? I mean, what's going on there? So let's go back to that idea that what you want is a connected brain. Now, one of the things that we have learned, uh, you know, it used to be thought that the brain stopped developing and you stopped developing neurons and connections, you know, in your teenage years. 
Uh, that's not the case. We know that's not the case. It's, al it's always been obvious that it's not the case if you think about it, because if you create a new memory, that's by creating new connections. So we know that there is plasticity in the brain. We know that the brain is able to renew itself as well as to be damaged. And one of the things that enables the brain to become more connected is stimulation of all, all sorts. So you talked about social stimulation. That's really important in terms of, of creating um, a, 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 an engaged individual whose brain is working hard. Now, one of the problems about sensory loss can be that you have less of those inputs. You get less uh, stimulation from the, um, from the herd environment uh, with respect to hearing loss. And that, that, can, that can interfere with one's social communication and one's social interactions. And so you get less of that as well. So one of the things that we were interested in with hearing loss is that there are obviously ways of dealing with hearing loss for many people, not for everybody, but for many people. And there would be ways of mitigating those decreased social contacts for those individuals who have hearing loss, which is not remediable as well. And we, I think that, that it was, it was, it, it's, it's a, it points to the fact that there are, that all of our senses stimulate our brains. And if we stimulate our brains, our brains connect themselves and start to, and, and can even kind of heal themselves in some way. That's why social isolation is really important, even in later life for people with dementia. We need to have, people with dementia need to have lives that are still connected socially, where they are active and able to interact socially. And is, it that, and is it that social connection more than, for example, doing puzzles? I mean, some people have said, you know, if they do the, the crossword every day, um, that means they won't get dementia and they get very good at it and they do it very quickly. So they definitely won't get dementia because they're so good at doing the crossword. Um, is, is, that, is, is that about, is that the kind of brain stimulation or is it more about a range of everyday activities and conversations than, than doing puzzles and crosswords? I think it's much more the latter than the former. It's much more about that whole um, that whole set of social interactions that one does, rather than a specific magic uh, Sudoku that will cure your brain or whatever. Um, I, you know, I, I think that doing puzzles makes you better at doing puzzles, and that's great if you like doing puzzles because you get better at doing those puzzles. And people who do crossword puzzles generally like doing crossword puzzles, and that is a form of of mental stimulation. But there is so much more to sensory and mental stimulation than, you know, a crossword puzzle or a Sudoku. Yeah. And, and, you know, I think that we there is the issue that people seek to monetize these insights. And so you get a lot of people making very high uh, claims for particular um, brain training apps, for example. And you know, I, I, I'm fairly sure they do no harm whatsoever other than cost people money <laughs> and cost people time yes. in terms yes. of interacting but whether they do anybody real benefit i think the uh, the jury is a lot further out from, out on that and actually it is that balanced life which includes social interaction and uh, that actually seems to be the thing that is most useful things that include uh, physical activity so exercise and um, you know that that include uh, doing things that you need and want to do but I suppose the other right. thing to remember with that is that what we're talking about here with the Lancet Commission is preventing at a population level. So I was going to come and ask you, yes. over the whole country, and you can do as many Sudoku's as you like, and you might still develop dementia. Yeah, and it was interesting. So on, I'll come back to that point, but I know one of the things that Angela Rippon, the broadcaster in one of the programmes she did, pointed out was that um, part of the stimulation is doing something new and different that you haven't done before. And it doesn't matter if you get very good at it. So one of my first guests on these conversations was the former hostage, Terry Waite, who's 82 and said he'd taken up playing the ukulele. And he said he's not very good at it, but, he, but it's stimulating and he finds it in, engrossing. And I know Angela Rippon talked about learning a new language. It doesn't matter if you're rubbish at it, but the process, the, the brain stretch, if you like, of getting yourself to do something different makes a big, makes a big difference. I think that doing new things, I mean, I think humans are inquisitive and want to have new experiences. So it's great doing those things, but one shouldn't underestimate the value of doing the things that you already like doing and that you love. So right. listening to cherished pieces of music, you know, um, uh, that can that 
the the you know the aesthetic and the um, uh, the aesthetic value of that and the stimulating value of that can be uh, you know as much the hundredth time you hear something as the first time you hear something. Right. No, that's a very good point. Now let me come back to this population level measurement because one of the things it says in the study and when it gets picked up in the newspapers, this often gets misreported. I think it says that the Lancet Commission study says that there's a, you can reduce the risk of dementia by forty yeah. percent. Um, now, people think that means if I do all these things, there's a 40% less risk of me getting dementia. But I don't think that is what it's saying, is it? No, unfortunately, it is not saying that. No, it's uh, the 40% is the amount of, uh, of of dementia or cases of dementia that you get in a population. So in the United Kingdom, that would be, what, 850,000 cases of people with dementia at any particular one of time. So it would be about the new cases that are happening year, year on year. If you made these changes throughout your lifestyle, then up to 40% of that is potentially modifiable. Now, not everything that's potentially modifiable is actually, um, is, is, actually in is, is it possible to eradicate it from the population. Mm -hmm. It would be very difficult to eradicate depression from a population, for example. It would be very difficult to, um, to, to stop everybody from smoking. Um, so there are a number of things that are amenable to change and a number of things right. that aren't. The trouble is that even with the most connected brain, even with the brain that's been best looked after throughout its life, it is still possible that you will develop Alzheimer's disease. Yeah. And, and, that is, is, a, sorry, and that's, a, that's a difficult thing to hear because and, you know, as most health states are, they are a, they're an interaction between your genes and your environment. They're, they are they depend on luck as well as uh, yeah. as well as good uh, behavior during life. And there are people who are, you know, who have there are Nobel Prize winners who've gone on to uh, develop Alzheimer's disease. There are people who have been you know, fantastic authors who with, with gigantically uh, connected brains who have gone on to um, to develop Alzheimer's disease. Um, I think at best. One might think that, and part of that is going to be your genetic makeup. And by that, I'm not talking about simple genetics. It's a complex distributed genetics. Part of it's going to be do with that, to do with that. Part of it's going to be to do with your lifestyle. Uh, and it's impossible at the moment for us to work out on an individual basis whether you are one of those people who would benefit or not. All I would say, though, is that we have, uh, if you look at all of the factors, in the Lancet Commission, from education to hearing loss to treating hypertension through to social isolation and diabetes. We know that treating those has multiple health benefits. So right. having a system that attends to those, if it's going to be decreasing the, the, the instance of dementia as well as decreasing deaths by heart attacks, that's going to be really good. Okay. There's only one... One other thing that the Lancet Commission says about this is worth noting as well, though, because we have an aging population, even if we carry out these preventions, then there will still be an increasing number of people with dementia in the community that's simply dri driven by population aging and our success in enabling people to live longer lives. What we have to do is ensure that people live well whether they have dementia or whether they don't, and that we are appropriately hopeful and optimistic about the quality of life that individuals can have with dementia. And that's a really positive note to end on. I'm going to squeeze in very quickly. We've got more questions than we've got time for, so apologies to the people I don't ask, but two people, um, just quick questions, just as we come to a close, should we? Mary, uh, somebody called Mary's written in saying, thank you for mentioning hearing loss. I have significant hearing loss due to Meniere's disease, osteosclerosis, etc. Does this pose a risk of getting vascular dementia? I'm in my late 60s. So it's probably not vascular dementia as such. It's a, uh, it's the, it's the, the, the general, it's, it, 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 on an individual level, the amount of risk that, amount of extra risk that will come through having hearing loss is very small indeed. So it's very important to not worry that if you have a hearing problem, you are going to develop uh, dementia. The likelihood of it is very low. However, what it does mean is that you need to get your hearing, uh, your hearing as well treated as you possibly can, and to maintain your stimulation in other ways as well, to maintain uh, 
the um, you know the, the 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 social interaction that you have, the physical activity, uh, and to make sure other illnesses are treated, because you may be in a right. very slightly higher risk than other people. And this is a good point lead into this final question. I'll just squeeze in. It's somebody I think you might know. Because she says, "Hi, Shubi Ross here of the Joint Research Office." We have no dementia in our family either side. So does this provide some additional protection? Um, it, 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 it does and it doesn't. So that there are certain sorts of dementia that are highly hereditable. So that, um, uh, and the, so the individuals have them very early in life. And so sometimes in their forties or fifties and uh, sorry, thirties or forties. And those individuals may then, their children may then develop that. Those dementias are extraordinarily rare. And dementia is common enough so that a third of individuals, when they die, will have dementia. Uh, so that there are so that if you have many people with dementia in your family, it doesn't mean that you have the genetics of dementia. It right. doesn't mean that you're going to get dementia. If you have nobody with dementia in your family, it doesn't mean that you're not going to get dementia. There are there are some dementias that are caused by, you know, heart disease and all sorts of other things. There are some dementias that are caused by uh, that. There are some dementias that are more preventable than others. But uh, but no, I, I think that it's that there should be no you shouldn't worry about dementia. If there's a lot of people with dementia in your family, you should not worry about dementia. If there's nobody with dementia in your family, what you should be doing is thinking about brain health. You want a healthy brain because you have a better life with a healthy brain. So let's do everything that we can to keep our brain health positive. And I think that's a great note to end on. As these conversations are called healthy aging, that indeed is the message that there's an awful lot we can do to age healthily and well. And one of the elements that that does is increase the prevention of dementia at a population level and can make an individual difference as well. Professor Subi Banerjee, thank you very much for being with me this afternoon. Uh, it's been a fascinating conversation. Apologies, as I say, we didn't get to all the questions. Uh, just to let everyone know that next week, as it's the start of term, I've got as my guest, a former head teacher, Keith Oliver, who was diagnosed with dementia while working as a head teacher at the age of 55. So what difference did that make to his life and that of his wife, Rosemary? Uh, Keith will be my guest this time next week. Once again, Shubi Banerjee, thank you very much for joining me this afternoon. Bye, everybody. See you next week. Bye, Jeremy. Thank you very much.